All right. Good afternoon. We uh, we have two of our five uh, DevOps tracks talk talks done. Uh, the next talk. So this morning, if you were with us, we had um, uh, John Willis, who is a pure DevOps guy, uh, very active in the DevOps days, kind of give us a, a hurricane tour through how DevOps sees the world, independent of security. Uh, followed by David Mortman, one of our own, who's been very active in security, but has really been an early adopter of DevOps patterns as a way to get more stability and repeatability and automation and take human error out of things. And now we're going to go back towards the middle here, which is uh, Damon Edwards, who's also one of the co-hosts of the podcast for the DevOps Cafe. But more importantly, the way I got introduced to him was through Gene Kim and his book, uh, Posse, for the Phoenix Project. Uh, in, in that he was really the, it, a, a Sherpa guide helping people start their DevOps journey and get from nothing to some of the early positive patterns. Um, so we're really pleased that uh, now that our worlds are colliding, um, we're starting to have more partnerships and collaborations and crossovers with security. And I think this will be a great place to see how do we take it from fiction or theory into actual practice. Uh, and then after this, stick around for Chris Swan to show some of the more advanced uh, integration and technology stacks being built out of some of these toolkits. And then at the end, uh, we'll, we'll bring it home with Matt Tassaro of Rackspace, who uh, is actually using these things in practice as a security and ops guy. Thanks. Thanks, Josh. Can everybody hear me okay back there? Sounds good? Yeah, great. So, um, you know, the point of my talk is, you know, there's these DevOps transformations going on inside organizations, whether you believe in it or not, um, and it's an opportunity for, it's big change happening, and it's an opportunity for people to take advantage of it, and uh, this is a lot about uh, getting inside the mindset of the DevOps transformation going on inside companies, uh, what we see going on across the industry, um, and part to make yourself more relevant, and also part to leverage it for your own self-interest, self your own goals, right? What do, you, what do you want to accomplish and achieve? So uh, that being said, let's uh, get started. Uh, Josh, introduce me. I'm Damon Edwards. You can follow me uh, at Twitter, um, on Twitter, at Damon Edwards. Uh, also do a podcast, which is a lot of fun. Um, it's kind of like a, uh, imagine a very unprofessional, uh, not very well produced Charlie Rose. Uh, John and I do this long form interviews where we get people from really all walks of life in kind of related to this DevOps world. We've had, you know, CEOs, we've had folks like Jez Humble, who've, you know, popularized, uh, um, Continuous Delivery, David uh, Anderson, the founder of Kanban, Luke Kinise, founder of Puppet Labs, Patrick Dubois over there, um, Sean Porter, uh, uh, Sensu monitoring uh, guru, the IT skeptic. So uh, we really uh, kind of do this long form, dig into interviews uh, where we find all about what they have to know and offer the world. And uh, it's gotten kind of popular, so we enjoy it. And um, we hope to kind of feature more security related topics in the future. So if you've got folks to recommend, shoot us an email or just uh, subscribe on iTunes and uh, tell us in the comments what you, uh, what you think. So, um, you know, my kind of view of the world or where I, how I kind of got to be standing here today, uh, a couple of things. So, um, I've, you know, I'm kind of a lucky person. I get to see the industry from a lot of different perspectives. I already talked about the DevOps Cafe stuff that we did. We get to just interview and talk to people from a community perspective. But from a work perspective, I'm a co-founder of uh, two companies. Um, the original one was DTO Solutions. Um, it was an automation and process improvement uh, company. Now does a lot of what's you know called DevOps, um, and really got known for helping big enterprises translate all the cool you know stuff they were seeing at conferences on the stage. The hey, that looks good, great, but it never worked for us. How do we break it down to first principles and translate it to something that actually work for us, right? And uh, you know that was a lot of process, a lot of uh, culture um, and kind of you know organizational dynamics consulting, and a metric crap ton of automation design and automation implementation and those type of things. And more recently, um, a co-founder of another company, uh, a company called Simplify Ops, that was built to uh, put uh, services and tooling um, around um, a open source project called Rundeck, uh, which is freely available. You can go check it out. I'll mention where that fits in later. And yeah, so because of those two things, I get to see a whole, a whole lot of interesting views of the industry. Uh, caveat, I am not a security expert. It's not the point of my talk. <laughs> the other people will talk about security. I'm here to learn about security from all of you. I'm here to talk about uh, the process. And really, people ask, well, you know, what do I do, right? We straddle automation. We straddle process improvement. We straddle culture. And I like to say, you know, we're, uh, we're outcome guys, right? And by outcome, I mean, you know, it's... Uh, in every business, there's this core process, right? It's from a business person's head says, I got an idea, to where that's 
featured or has manifested itself as some type of customer outcome that we could measure, hopefully through getting more money, right? So that's what I mean by outcome. I'm most interested in how do we bring these topics together to improve that, that process. And really, you know, going back to, if you look, go back to what the uh, lean manufacturing folks said, right? What's this about, right? It's about giving the customer what they want, when they want it, and uh, at the lowest cost possible, right? And really in order of importance, right? Make sure we got the right fit, they've gotta be happy, make sure they've got it when they want it, make sure they've got it at the lowest, at the lowest uh, cost possible. And uh, yeah, it seems straightforward, right? But obviously uh, this is, um, you know, a lot of things need to happen along the way, right? So cartoonishly, uh, we tend to divide those camps up into the dev camp, the people that are incentivized to make things, to create things, and the ops camp, people are incentivized to run things, protect things, keep things, uh, keep things, uh, keep things going. And obviously, you know, we know that, you know, there's, uh, all sorts of things in between, right? S security, uh, famously built complaints, security is not on there. QA is not on there. Performance isn't on there. Um, you know, networks, there's a lot of things that, that, that take place. But cartoonishly, we found it easy to talk about the world in terms of dev, dev and ops, right? So, you know, but what happens is as we start to specialize, this, as these, these, uh, these ba barriers need to be crossed, we have different functional jobs, different tooling, different career paths, different interests, and these silos, both implicit and explicit, start to form between these, uh, these, different, these different areas of expertise, right? And these are really what we talk about when we mean DevOps problems, right? Uh, it's the bottlenecks, it's the risks, it's the inefficiencies, it's all the stuff that's gonna get in the way of that outcome of happening, going from an idea to a running feature in a customer-facing a customer environment, right? Um, so, you know, this, actually John uh, Willis, our opening speaker today, calls this his, uh, his, his favorite DevOps in a nutshell uh, slide, right? So really all DevOps is is about saying, how can we remove those barriers, those risks, those bottlenecks, those inefficiencies, so we can shorten our time to market, shorten our lead times, um, so we can get faster feedback to the business, get faster, and uh, that faster feedback is not just from the holistic perspective, but also individually. How do we give developers faster feedback? How do we give the ops teams faster feedback? How do we give security teams faster feedback, right? And all that bundles up to, we can give customers what they want, when they want it, and at a, uh, at a lower cost if we do it right, right? So now, I think what makes you know, DevOps unique is that um, uh, it's really just an umbrella of ideas. And it's not a technology thing, it's not just a process thing, it's not just a culture thing, it's all of those things, right? Because in order to really make those outcomes happen, we need to be thinking across all three of those lines, right? Um, and you know, from the business perspective, it's time to market and quality, right? And that really filters all the way down to what we do on the keyboard every day. And it's something to think about because you know, in the security world, we think about quality quite a bit, right? Um, you know, it's, it's quality, I guess, or security being an aspect of, uh, of a product's quality, but how often we think about time to market, right? And how often we think about uh, our effect on the rest of, or our being, I'm, I'm now talking like you guys, so I've been here for two days. Uh, how do we work on our effect on the rest of the, the, the organization? So uh, more kind of background here. So the signals that the organization is getting better, right? How do you look at your organization and say, oh, we're gonna try some of these new ideas. We wanna get better at this, right? Well, how do we look at our, our, our capabilities actually improving? There's uh, really four things that we see are the, probably the best indicators of if you're doing a good job of this stuff. Sorry, I was holding up three fingers. Four things, four things. Uh, first is lead times, right? That's not just the end-to-end -end lead time, which obviously is the ultimate goal, how fast from an idea to where it's in front of a customer, but more importantly, across the entire organization. What's our lead time on delivering environments? What's our lead time on turning around um, you know, code releases? What's our lead time on turning around security fixes? Right, or security scans, whatever it might be, are our lead times, number one, dropping, and number two, are they becoming more predictable, right? It's a pretty easy thing for us to measure. Um, that's probably already exists in some project management uh, folks' um, uh, spreadsheets somewhere in your company today without doing anything, anything new. Um, getting a little more interesting here, mean time to detect, right? So how quickly can we detect there's actually a problem? And that's not just, again, at the macro service level, but also at the more local level. How quickly can we detect that I made a change and it's not right, right? How quickly we can release that, check that, hey, these two versions are not compatible with each other, right, when we go to deploy them or things like that. So be time to detect how quickly are we able to detect things is a sign of uh, are we getting better. Um, and also the meantime detect also shows is do we have the right visibility into our systems? Do we have the right monitoring? Do we have things broken down well enough to where we understand correlation, cause and effect, those type of things. 
mean time to repair um, is, you know, obviously how quickly can we respond, right? And there's really two aspects to this. There's mean time to resolve, which is like, oh, I got the service back up, right? And then there's mean time to fix, meaning how quickly can we get something from, I know that's broken and I got it working again, but how, or I, you know, did something to, to, to put a Band-Aid on it. How quickly can I drive that through the life cycle to get it, to get it, to get it fixed? And uh, last one here, um, probably the most unusual is this notion of quality at the source, right? Uh, so in the manufacturing world, it's easy to see this notion of scrap, right? So when you um, uh, produce something that's not fit for the next person in the assembly line, that's called scrap. Either it doesn't, parts don't fit together, it's not quite what they expected, it's the wrong quantity of it. Uh, the most popular one right, we see in organizations is um, provisioning servers, right? How many times do you ask for, I need this environment, you know, two weeks later, hey, here it is, you log in and you're like, crap, this is all wrong, right? And you either got to say, this doesn't work for me, I can't log in at all, or this is missing this, or I got to go re-image, re see people re-imaging their own servers. That's all scrap because you weren't ready to do the things you needed to do uh, because the people upstream from you provided you with something that was, that was incomplete. So number one, we want to see less of that throughout the entire organization. So less scrap and less rework. But most importantly, um, well, I guess, sorry, less scrap is the most important, but almost as important is where do you notice that scrap, right? Does it, hey, I, don't, I didn't catch it until we try to do a production deployment, or is it I caught it at check-in, or is it I caught it in my IDE, or you know, where do you catch that? How far from the source of the mistake did the error get before it was caught? And close that is to zero or one, right, that it was actually caught by the person making the change. Um, the, the, no, the better we know, uh, we're doing and the more competency we have, we have internally. So when folks are saying all these DevOps, you know, kind of, you know, fluffy ideas, at the end of the day, you, this is how your life, you should be seen, be able to measure these things and see your life, uh, your life improving, right? So uh, some other folks already covered this, um, you know, why DevOps, why now, right? If we just ignore it, it won't go away. Uh, you know, these ideas, do we, do we really have to pay attention? Um, you know, curious thing going on in the business. And this is good to leverage for yourself. You want to raise the, the, the visibility of what you're working on. Um, you know, this, 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 this idea has been floating around. John mentioned before the lean, the lean startup. Um, you look at, um, you know, previous than that, the whole uh, lean manufacturing, the goal, uh, theory of constraints. Um, what everyone's talking about is how fast can we learn as a company? How quickly can we, uh, can we move, can we adapt to the market to, uh, to beat our competitors? So the latent demand's already there for the business. And I think what happened with DevOps is what started mostly as a technology, you know, kind of professional movement inside technology, say, let's make our lives better. Um, people started writing about this and, uh, you know, the big vendors got involved. They said, hey, this is great. This is actually tapping into this latent demand we're seeing. Uh, and we see, you know, the, the analysts got involved as well. Um, so, you know, you see this kind of landslide of, of, hey, you know, this could be the technology answer for these problems we're looking to solve. Obviously, you know, conferences have gone nuts on the idea. But really, if you want to blame somebody, um, this presentation uh, just kind of blurred out there, but uh, Nicole Velas Nicole Forsgren Velasquez, Velasquez, I always mess up her name, I apologize. And Gene Kim, author of The Phoenix Project, uh, they put together this study, uh, they called the 2014 State of the DevOps Survey, right? So, um, you know, they got almost 10,000 respondents, 100 countries, all across these different industries. Half had more than 500 servers, half had less than 500 servers, so all, all range of, of companies. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they asked about, and they really got down, oh, so I should probably say, Nicole is a, she's a business professor, she's not involved in the IT industry really. Um, uh, that much. Um, she also is a, f a statistician, um, teaches at uh, Utah State. So there's real academic rigor uh, behind this. And they found some pretty startling things when they looked at the business side of these companies that are doing these practices that we now know can be categorized under these DevOps ideas. And they found that, you know, these high-performing orgs are getting twice the rate of, uh, twice the change success rate and 12 times faster mean time to recovery, that MTTR uh, stat I was talking about, about before. So that alone is, is pretty cool. But then it gets really nuts. Um, you know, they looked at these, these 10,000 companies and figured out that, th that those that are, that are these high performing IT practices that are now in as DevOps umbrella are twice as likely to exceed profitability, market share, and production goals, productivity goals. And they have 50% higher market capitalization growth over the previous three years. So, you know, at that point, 
business people's heads, you know, that got their attention, right? So, you know, they're saying that, hey, DevOps, I don't know what that means, but it's going to give us the capability to learn faster than our competitors. So bottom line, it's here to stay, right? So we just got to deal, deal, deal with it. So what is, uh, you know, what does that mean for us, right? Again, I'm saying us because I've been a part of the security tribe for a couple days now. And, uh, you know, is it an opportunity? Is it a risk? Um, you know, what do we do, right? And I think the important part is knowing that, uh, you know, all the, the dreams, everything that, 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 that security wants to achieve in an organization, um, as this board is being kind of redrawn, now's our opportunity to reset that relationship and figure out how, as the org's being redrawn, how do we insert ourselves in the right, in the right place? How do we talk the language of the people that, that, are, that are going through this process? Because for whatever it is, they've got the ear of the business and they're getting the funding and the, um, the, uh, uh, the mandate to go and do it. And as also John mentioned this morning, there's gonna be a conference in October, the DevOps Enterprise Conference. Um, whether or not you wanna go is up, is up to you, but um, it's all large enterprises talking about how they're implementing these techniques. So global banks, you know, insurance companies, manufacturing companies, um, you know, large, large technology companies, um, all about, not about, you know, selling stuff, but purely about, hey, here are the techniques we're trying and here's what's, what's happening. It's going to be like a hundred or so, or so uh, different presentations over three days. So, um, you know, it, this is a chance for us to, uh, for security to re reinsert itself, right? So got to think about, well, what's this, what are people trying to accomplish here? What's the, what's the, what's the driving mindset that's going on here, right? And I think, you know, when you come down to the core of it, it's the realization that silos are the number one enemy of throughput and quality, right? I mean by a silo is anywhere you have to have a handoff, anywhere that somebody does something and then I need to hand off somebody, something off to somebody else and they need to reset their context, receive what I have, and then go and try to make sense of it and, and do something. Um, throughput automatically drops and quality automatically drops, right? That's where those handoffs are where we see the number one source of, um, of you know, miscommunication, um, you know, misunderstanding, uh, things not being incompatible, always happens at those, those, those handoff points. And, you know, the most critical part of it is not just the it's slippery and difficult to hand off complex things, but it's also a, a knowledge and context problem, right? The farther you go to the left, um, you know, the more application knowledge they have. And as you cross those silo boundaries, that knowledge drops, drops uh, off very quickly. On the same way, the operational knowledge goes the opposite way. The people on the far right got all the knowledge about how stuff works and what it's being deployed to. The people on the right, on the left, who are creating things to, to be deployed to those things have the least amount of context, right? And then the business intent, what the hell is this company trying to do? That's all the way to the left and quickly runs out thin until you get to, get to the other side. And the larger organization you get to, the more classic organizations, um, you see this, this, this lack of context and this, and this, and this, and this pulling apart. And um, it might seem fine when you're in your silo because you're like, hey, I'm a you know, application security engineer. Hey, I'm an operations engineer. Hey, I'm a, a QA engineer, whatever it might be. I'm great at my craft. But if you look at, at, the, at the health of, of the end-end life cycle that you're a part of, the thing that you're getting paid to do, um, you know, it, it suffers greatly the more you have these silos and the diff more difficult they are to, uh, to deal with, right? And uh, yeah, I already covered this point, right? So everyone on the left's got all the ownership in the world. I can change everything, but I got no accountability for, making it, for actually making it work when the customer cares about it. And the folks on the right have all the accountability, but they've got no ownership. I just, I just take the crap people give me and I have to find out a way to make it, to make it work, right? Um, it's not a good way to run, to run any business. If you took this to you know, Ford and asked them that you know, this is the way you want to run their, their, uh, their manufacturing plant, they'd you know, run, you out of the, uh, run you out of the building, right? It should be no different for, for a uh, technology organization, right? So what a lot you see going on where all these DevOps ideas kind of push towards is they all sort of end up in the same place, which is we're going to redraw our organization or redraw how we assemble around our work to um, into more of these cross-functional teams with the idea of saying that I want to have a cross-functional organization aligned towards things my customer cares about. So you look at the high performers, they say, look at your org chart, look at how work organizes in your company. Can your customers from the outside identify how that actually works, right? Nobody cares about Sorry, customers don't care about, oh, that's the AppSec team, that's the NetSec team, that's the InfoSec team, that's compliance, that's privacy, that's networks, that's storage, that's, you know, uh, uh, development team A, development team B. It doesn't make sense to them. You look at the high performers, they say, you know, let's assemble those people around what we're trying to achieve. That's the search team, that's the e-commerce team, that's the store, where, that's the store warehouse 
warehouse team. So, you know, they're fundamentally realigning uh, their organization by these value streams, these customer identifiable uh, value streams, and then thinking about how do we improve throughput and quality through those, um, through those, uh, those pipelines. Now, I'm not, something I'm not gonna talk about today, um, which is the, a, a very key part of this, is um, the culture behind this. And if you're in a big enterprise, culture is a slippery, a slippery, sticky word and people don't like to use it. So use organizational dynamics, okay? Um, or alignment and incentives or whatever it is that works in your organization. But you, know, you really need to, to, uh, you know, to understand the culture of making this work. And a lot of that really comes down to this, uh, this notion of freedom and responsibility. We're giving those teams the freedom to do what they need to do to get their job done, to provide that service to the customer, but we're also giving them total responsibility, meaning that you know, they have to meet the, the full uh, you know, context, they have to meet all their compliance constraints, they have to meet all of our security constraints. You know, they're getting their mandate from the outside, but then we're empowering them to you know, leave them alone to do what they need to get done. But they also own that thing ongoing, right? So it's none of the, oh, I did it once, you know, I got freedom, I did what I wanted to do, but then I don't have any responsibility because it's the ops team and the SRE teams, or oh, the AppSec guys, they'll catch that, right? That's not what freedom responsibility means. But that's not today's talk. Um, if you really want to know a lot about that, uh, there's a guy named Roy Rappaport, he's done some great presentations uh, from uh, Netflix. You can Google cloud operations at Netflix or actionable metrics, Netflix, and uh, taking his talks that really dive into this freedom and responsibility idea and how that manifests itself. Um, and it's, uh, it's quite fascinating. And by the way, at the end, I'm gonna have a bit.ly short link. These slides are already online, so you, can, you don't have to bother taking notes or whatever it might be. So all right, so how, right? So okay, great. So we got this idea that we're gonna, that everybody wants to redraw the organization. Think about cross-functional teams delivering uh, services that the, that the customer cares about and owning that thing from cradle to, to grave, right? So how do we actually do that? You know, the first one, so this is actually, uh, this is a real value stream map. Um, we had to squish it all into one page to, so it's a little bit, uh, um, kind of reinforces the spaghetti aspect. But uh, large enterprise, they thought they had a deployment automation problem, right? Let me start with that. So how you read one of these things, um, I really just kind of a lot to dump on you here, but these fat arrows are, uh, artifact flows, right? Things that actually, that's packages, things are actually physical things that flow through the environment. All these little lines are information flow, like Word documents, conversations, tickets, uh, spreadsheets, um, you know, whatever it might be, right? To get through the organization to get, your ch to get, to get something, uh, something done, right? And all these little pies here are how much time is spent in that step doing value producing time or um, waste, like wait time, wait for someone else to do something. Uh, so, you know, time on the keyboard versus total time for the step. And you can see the white is actual time doing something. The red is how much time we're just, something's just sitting, uh, sitting with us or we're kind of spinning our, our wheels. And they had a massive problem. It's taken 18 months to get um, a major release through. So of course, everybody was pushing things out as an emergency release, which just caused even more chaotic problems. But you know, fundamentally realized they didn't have a deployment automation problem, they had an information flow problem, right? That everybody had to have this context information flow scheduling is another one. And so, uh, you know, what they, uh, um, uh, dependency management, also another information flow. So what they did is, you know, what a lot of folks realize that kind of table stakes in this game is turning all that information flow as much as possible into artifact flow. So instead of handing off a readme document that tells me how to uh, tell if something I installed is correct, hand off a test, Some, something can execute. So it's, it's things come as packages, I, I, I have all of my, instead of handing off a, a, another document on how to install something, it's, it's actually giving me some executable code to, to do it. So it's the idea of taking all those information flows and pushing them down into that, that, art, that artifact flow. Um, very deep concept, a lot to go in, in, into here, so uh, I don't have the time to do that, but um, we can talk afterwards if you wanna talk more about that. So, you know, once that happens, once you're able to drive uh, that information into that artifact flow, um, which is a major task in of itself, the other thing that, 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 that these uh, teams are doing is they're realizing that they wanna drive all change through an SDLC. You look at what happens in software development, it's great, we've got, everything happens around, you know, Git, around our source repository. Uh, we got a CI server that builds our packages. Our packages go into some package repo if we're, you know, if we're being formal about it. We've got some deployment tools that's gonna take those packages and do something with it. So this is a nice, you know, kind of pipeline. What's different about them though, is that 
they're doing everything this way, right? So they're looking at the entire software stack from, uh, you know, from uh, how we, from the operating system or you know all the way up to, uh, you know, the, the, the application. All of that is as much as possible is being driven as source uh, through this 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 SDLC. So when they're producing these these uh, these packages, they're basically producing entire environments as a version release, right? Now it's going to be different tools. It's going to be different, different uh, uh, types of packages. But in, in in theory, if you stand back far enough, you'll see a consistent lifecycle across both application and infrastructure, with you know strong relationships between between the two. Um, you know, one of the good examples, another place that I think security can really, uh, you know, we see security really played into here, is really teaming up with the QA folks and looking at all the tests become artifacts as well. So they're focusing in on this notion of. Uh, you know, but the speed people want to move, manual testing just doesn't, it doesn't cut it, right? It's an external inspection by a third party who's going to be manually testing something is not going to be enough to catch, to catch all of our problems. And if you don't believe me on that, we can talk about it later, but there's, there's a lot that's been going on in the QA world to prove um, that, that, that reliance on manual inspection by, you know, third parties uh, just doesn't, doesn't cut it. In fact, most people take it as far as to say they don't trust manual testing, they only trust if you can prove it through a repeated automated testing. And you know they look at this as a central point as well to start building an immune system to say let's get the uh, you know the people that care about functional testing the people that care about security testing uh, the people that care, care about performance testing and get them all to collaborate in the source repository um, to drive the tools that will build up the uh, the um, uh, the immune system for for our business then all of that is going into uh, some kind of structured package repository and then is being driven out the other end through. Um, some type of operations console, right? Go ahead. So is there some reason why you don't include the documentation on the Uh Yeah, because mostly, it's a, long, it's a loaded question. Uh, documentation is one of those um, information flows, right? If I have to give you documentation, now, do you mean documentation for like an end user? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. To me, yeah, that's just that's just that's that's just a uh, that's just a functional requirement of the project, and that goes in the same the same life. It's got to be driven through the same life cycle. So, in really, in this kind of mindset, you really have two human touch points. One is source. One is we're we're, we're collaborating over here, and the sec and all this basically looks like a, a build process. So, you know, rather than being a uh, um, you know, a software delivery a software delivery life cycle. It's really a service delivery life cycle. It's like this is all the things that need to go into our our product. So there's no difference uh, between the artwork for your product and um, you know the functional interface of your product and and, and the documentation. It might be different people writing it. Might be different skill sets to actually write it. But at the end of the day, it's just a functional part of your product, and it all needs to be driven through the same process. Sure. I mean, I ran out of boxes, but it would be part of the code. We, 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 we call that content, right? So yeah, you got it. No problem. Yeah. I mean, that, but that's the basic idea, right? It's the same, it's, and it's the same people that are doing the collaboration around the, uh, you know, the source repository, and they're executing the automation. And by the way, the automation they're executing, and the procedures they're executing was also specified um, and driven back to that, that 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 source repository. So the idea being there that everything we do looks like a version product release. It's almost like bringing product product discipline to uh, you know to operating online online services. Were you gonna say something, Josh? Or are you just stretching? Yeah, well, you might have it later, but I've heard a couple days where the people say it's static and it's dynamic code analysis. Mm -hmm. Look at the quality of what the first component. Yeah, where's that fit in? Where do those that comes later? Uh, when they jump in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we get to get to that. So, um, but before we get there, there's another one too that says, okay, great. If I'm one company with one business line, I can do this cross-functional team, fantastic, right? But what do I do if I have 30 business lines, if I have 500 applications, if I have you know, a global organization that I need to pull into this? I can't do that. I can't have um, you know, all my QA experts in uh, everywhere. I can't have you know, my security experts. There's not enough of you guys to be, to be everywhere. You know, monitoring, metrics, and other, all these are kind of cross-cutting concerns that need, to, um, that need to take place. One of the most classic ones is environments. I can't have a, a separate network and a separate infrastructure for everybody in my, in my organization. So how do, the, how do these companies, when they redraw this organization for these cross-functional uh, customer value aligned uh, teams, delivery teams, 
how do I deal with these cross-cutting concerns? And if you look at what they're fundamentally doing, um, they're basically saying, if you, aren't, if you are a cross-cutting concern, you need to turn it into a, a service provider, right? A, a self-service uh, interface that can be used by the rest of the organization to pull those services as needed, right? So again, it comes back to that it's not I'm sending, a, I'm not sending something over to them for them to do something with it and send it back to me. It's they need to turn their job around to where it says I'm providing a service that those folks will, 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 uh, uh, will use. For example, QA. We see this happen a lot with QA. QA organizations are mysteriously disappearing, right? And the QA folks aren't going anywhere. Quality is actually getting better. So, you know, what's, what's happening? They're saying is that we're making our QA team be nothing but toolsmiths and coaches. They're, they're there to teach the organization and about what the standards are for testing, how to testing, how to do the testing. They're uh, working on creating basically tooling, tool, tools, services that the rest of the organization can consume to define their tests and to, uh, um, uh, to, to run their own tests, but they aren't actually doing the testing. The actual, the actual writing of the test and executing the test is all falling down to these cross-functional uh, these cross-functional teams. So they've taken on themselves to say, we're a service provider now. I'm going to create a service that those teams can, can pull from. It also creates a very interesting, interesting dynamic because it makes you have to create a service good enough to where the rest of the organization will want to use you versus replace you with somebody else. Like we see happen a lot with environments, right? That um, it came down to, I'm tired and wait on operations to give me infrastructure. I'm going to go to, I'm going to go to something like, like, like Amazon. I'm going to go to a cloud service. And that's that's the key idea here is that it functions like that to say, you know, I don't really care about how Amazon does what it does. I have an API. The API says, give me, you know, X number of environments and it's me. I'm on demand and I can, I can, I can pull it. So, you know, how do they do it? So in terms of being a service provider, what are the things that these organizations do? They think about, you know, standardized offerings, right? To say, you know, this, these are the 10 kinds of platforms that we support. You can get any of these on demand, as many as you, as you want. Um, you know, they think about it as a pull-based relationship, that the users are pulling these services as they needed. And it could be a web UI that you hit that something, you know, shows up for you, like an environment. It could be an API that you call. It could be a tool, like some types of, you know, these analysis tools were, that uh, Josh was just referencing. Um, they're on demand and self-service. It's not fill out a ticket and wait for somebody. It's I push a button and I get what I need when I, when I need it. Um, you know, the implementation knowledge is there. They use the same concept. They have a source repository that they're working out of, but it's not necessary for normal use. I don't have to know how the monitoring team is setting up the monitoring service that, that, that they're giving me to use. I just know, here's my APIs, here's my libraries I can use. I use those APIs and libraries, and oh look, here's the dashboards um, and operations once my code gets there and I can see it all instrumented and I can see what I, what I need. And uh, you know, the interesting part from a professional development perspective is the providers, the people in, in these providing teams, cross-functional providing teams, they're spending their time building a service and coaching their users. They aren't spending their time in the mud actually you know, doing the, day, the work day in and day out. They're thinking, how can I build the best service that can be pulled by these other teams to um, make their life better and, and accomplish our, our goals? So, you know, it takes this kind of holistic mindset we are talking before about, you got to think about it from an organizational perspective, process perspective, and a, a tooling perspective. So kind of four quick steps to get started down this path. One is you got to define your offerings, right? This is, a, this is purely a, a people and process thing. You got to say, what is it that we need to do to uh, provide these, this better security service to, to our, um, to these delivery teams for them to pull and use? And, you know, don't think of it in terms of like, oh, we're going to give them Oracle as a service. Think of it how Amazon does. It's like, here's S3, here's your storage service, here's your database service, right? Um, they're very kind of specific of functional, what you want to get, what, what you want to get, want to get done, and then build the interfaces from, from there. The second part is, you know, taming the tool sprawl, right? So you got this sprawl of, of these various scripts, various tools, things you do. If you look at how these high performers do it, they don't say, hey, our developers don't care about the 11 tools that I want them to use to scan for vulnerabilities. I need to tame that and bring that into one common service, one common interface that they can, that, that they can use, one common configuration they can use, keep it simple, keep it, keep it easy. Uh, so that's a purely a tooling issue. Um, once you've got the, the tool sprawl uh, tamed, it's about setting up self-service interfaces, right? That's one of the most critical parts is it can't just be, hey, go run these five scripts. That's not a self-service interface, right? Um, and it's a two-way relationship. They need both the button to push and they need the, the feedback from which that button is, um, is pushed. Again, think about using your favorite SaaS service, not, uh, not using uh, you know, your favorite 
set of tools. Um, and then last one being, you know, set up secure access. Some companies like Netflix, Netflix has this thing where they say that even the secretary can deploy to production. Like literally nobody, once you're inside their network, you have free reign and free love to do whatever you want, except for the PCI environment, obviously. But, uh, you know, that's really up to you. No enterprises work like that. They need to be very fine grained specific about where things happen. Um, one run deck plug here. If you really want to look at and say, you know, what's an example of a tool people are using to do these bottom three things once they've got their offerings defined, tame the sprawl, set up self-service interfaces, set up secure access. Uh, it's an open source project. You can go ahead and try it out, rundeck.org. Uh, had to uh, throw that in there. Um, so what are the things that can't be automated, right? So this comes down to, well, we, you know, what about, hey, we need to do a security review or we need to do uh, some type of, uh, some type of that coaching I was, I was talking about where folks want to come in and say, um, you know, I need you to come look at this architecture or sit in my design meetings or whatever, whatever it might be. Um, a good rule of thumb to think about is that in a, in a sort of high throughput organization, ticket systems are used for exceptions, not for the day-to-day -day work, right? You know, ticket systems are usually the, the indicator of a silo, right? I'm gonna fill out some request, I'm gonna stick it in there. Uh, someday someone's gonna come along and pull it off the queue. They're gonna ask me some questions. They're gonna do something for me. I'm gonna get it back, it's gonna be wrong. They're gonna ask us other questions, we're gonna do it again, and we're gonna bounce back and forth, right? It's a typical spiral of, of, uh, of, of, of death. And if you see what you know, the high-performing organizations are doing and thinking about, about, about throughput and flow, they're saying, hey, how can we actually, well, I guess, sorry, let me back up here. These request queues you want, you know, the, the, that leads to bottlenecks, just slows lead times down, uh, reinforces organizational silos, you know, it, it leads to misinterpretation or omissions. That value stream map I showed you guys before, if you walk through an organization and say, you know, where are all the points that you have ticket systems, the more ticket systems you see, um, and there's uh, the more uh, throughput problems and quality problems they end up having, it's an interesting correlation. And you can usually jump into that place and say where you see handoffs through a ticket system, that's usually the hotspots. We track where, where things go, go, uh, go wrong. So, you know, the things you can automate and you can turn into a self-service request, that's great, but what if you can't, uh, you know, how do you mitigate the negative impacts of these request queues if you can't automate it? Like design reviews, right? What do you, what do, you do? Um, and, you know, something simple of thinking about it as uh, using a work management system like Kanban, right? And this is why Kanban's great for this type of stuff. Are you guys familiar with Kanban or people have used? Okay, great. So I'll bring up the obvious point. The obvious points you already know. So let's talk about, um, you know, this only works if you, you know, set up a well, just like you were doing with your automated, automated services, set up a well-defined set of offerings and stick to them. So we're gonna do a design review and or we're gonna do a, a coaching set, a four hour coaching session, or we're gonna do a you know, pen test or whatever it might be. Uh, I guess the pen test would be automated, right? But whatever it would, would be, you know, there's these standard human services that people would do and we're using them to, uh, you know, through this kind of system to also enforce the work in progress for each, uh, each part of the organization so we can w work on optimizing the flow and get to the point where we're starting to have a guaranteed SLA for that service, which makes the organization extremely happy to say, hey, we've got these standard interfaces and we've got a standard SLA for you. If you want something outside of this, then you gotta go and raise a ticket and talk about it as an exception and try to um, you know, negotiate that way. Maybe we need to add an extra, an extra, uh, an extra service. And you know, using something like this is, um, is really essential because if you enforce the work in progress limits, you can also protect the capacity of your team, right? So that's one of the, the greatest side effects of pe seeing people going to, um, to this Kanban type service for the human uh, required uh, services is the complaints about, I can never get those people to come help me or I'm getting pulled in 10 different directions or I'm tired of those app, te app teams requesting one of my guys they show up and they sit in meetings for four days and I can't get them to do anything else. All those problems tend to go away when you treat it like um, a human powered service and use some type of work management permission system like Kanban to, to rule it, to make it through. So, uh, all right, as the other big complaint here is, oh my God, security compliance, like what are we, we can't do this, this is impossible. You know, we need to have all these separations, we're just gonna lose control of everything, right? So let's look at actually where, you know, and there's a lot about this, um, uh, in various conference presentations where they dive deep into even how people do this type of thing in you know, PCI compliant environments. The guys at uh, Etsy, um, you know, billion plus dollars worth of online transactions, obviously serious PCI uh, concerns, obviously a serious uh, hacker target, 
and uh, you know they run this type of um, this type of process, and they've got a lot of detail on how they do it. But let me just kind of point out the highlights of to say, well, where are the the leverage points for for security, right? Um, obviously, we're now talking about having a single place. Uh, now, metaphorically, I say single place. There might be multiple repositories. It might actually physically look a little different, but in in a theoretical sense, we've got one common place where people are all changes being driven through and we can um, you know in interact with and make it part of our standard process to do the reviews there um, you know through this these automated build processes is where you know people are hooking in we talked about earlier before about about gauntlet um, most of a lot of this, this the, the tools I saw out in the uh, um, in the lobby I'll talk about this but you know hooking those uh, those services into um, you know that that build and delivery process um, you know really collaborating with the QA folks to look at the, uh, the testing side of things to say, hey, how do we uh, build the, um, uh, um, all the security tests we want into that? Um, obviously, component vulnerability and governance, what the hell is going on in our environment, right? That's, that's uh, easy to do here. Um, as well as access policy and operational security checks. Um, so really there's far more opportunity for actually, uh, to actually uh, leverage security here and everything can be driven off of the tools, information from the tools, except for people working on the design and code reviews and writing additional uh, additional tests. Compliance, same thing. What's changed? Um, where did the change go? You know, what do we use to validate the change? Who has access to what environment? Uh, what did uh, what, when, and where? Uh, what was executed on the box to make the change? All that information is readily available, um, and the human interaction is really you know just those those two uh, those two points. So. Uh, one last thing here, if you want a litmus test for, hey, how do I know, I, I want to get involved here, I want to suggest things to the company to make, it, to make it better. How do I know the things I'm suggesting are going to be working in the right direction here? It's sort of a DevOps litmus test, right? Um, first one, am I helping folks to reduce cycle time and improve quality, right? Am I helping to eliminate handoffs or reduce the friction of those handoffs that can't be eliminated? Am I improving tool-to-tool -to -tool artifact flow and eliminating manual information flow, right? Um, Am I eliminating those manually fulfilled request queues um, and other sources of people waiting around for, uh, for, uh, for other people? And am I improving the awareness and understanding of the current state and desired state of the end-to-end -end system? Now, honestly, if you hit all you know, five of these things, it's awesome. Um, usually it's you know, three, four type thing. But if you can't, if you're actually hurting any of these one things, it's time to go back to the drawing board because that's what your suggestions are going to be judged on by the rest of the organization. Because again, they're not just worried about security, they're worried about you know, time to market and, uh, and quality. So that is, that's it. I know I kind of blew through a lot of things, so uh, the slides are at the world's longest short URL up there. Uh, bit.ly <laughs> devops at appsec USA. I'll leave it up there. Uh, I think I got like one minute if anyone's got any questions, or I think people can actually can leave if they need, um, but if you got any questions or I think I'm smoking. Let me know. That's true. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Well, I knew enough to know that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and I think, but, but that is an issue that most organizations, one of the biggest complaints we see is that, um, well, both. Oh, sorry. So uh, Josh was pleased that I separated compliance and security and knew to do to do the two things. Um, but we see one of the you know teaching of the test, right? That's one of the most common complaints we see is that it, people only care about it when there's an auditor coming and then it's a four alarm fire and we have to drop everything we do. So no one's happy with that type of relationship. So I think you know evidence the, the evidence collection side of things as well as the uh, immune system style you know testing side of things is a huge advancement that I think is. Um, um, unfortunately, the silos between the app sec, the info sec, the net sec, the endpoint, I mean, it's just, it's a shame how much of a silo there is, um, because if they all banded together with the QA folks, they realize that they all have really the same goals. It's just the, the what they write in their tests might be a little bit different, um, but it's really where that would be, a, you know, that's an area of collaboration that um, I would love to see, you know, more of. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. Yes, yeah, so the question is if tickets are only for exceptions, how do you measure performance? So it doesn't mean we're not recording all that activity, but it means that the system is doing the, is doing the recording, right? So some people make these tools open up, basically dump the information into their ticket system, 
and they realize that that's terrible and they hate that, and it's instead they have their ticket system report to some other thing. Uh, the folks at, not to bring up Netflix again, but they, uh, uh, they have a thing called Kronos, which is a system that all tools dump information into so they can know exactly what changed, kind of when, when and where. Um, and so, you know, you also would overlay the human activity, like tickets over that as well. So you get a complete picture of what, of what, of what happened. So yeah, we want to record everything. We want, we want the, the, the log that the ticket system provides. I just don't want people using that as the interface for their day-to-day -day work. That makes sense. That's when the silos form and that's when, you know, bad things, bad things happen. But a lot of people do that because they want to protect their capacity and it's the only way they know how to organize their work. And with more of a flow-driven system like Kanban versus a repository type system like, like uh, a queue, like, uh, 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 like a database, they're measuring, they're, 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 they get better throughput, better visibility, better flow of work, and they still have an interface um, to protect themselves and to, govern, and to govern it, if that makes sense. Anybody else got any? Uh, Right, right. There's that, and so that's nice about the Kanban thing is eventually you get to the point where you have, you have, you have, you want to be able to provide a predictable SLA. And which is not for like, I get penalized if I fail it, it's just to provide that confidence. And you see actually confidence go up on the business side because they're like, hey, okay, I got it. I see a slot can come available. I argue amongst my colleagues as to what goes in that slot. And then I know as soon as it hits that slot, I know it's going to be X amount of time before it comes out the other end, eh, most of the time. And they feel comfortable and they see the workflow through and they see something stuck with the blocker on it. They go, hey, what's wrong? And you're like, oh, well, this is wrong. And then they come down screaming, nobody oh, got this going on in two weeks, this audit. You know, everybody stop working and go fix these problems. Then the other business folks just say, okay, we'll do that, but make sure everybody else, when I drop all these tickets down to, the, down to a holding bin, I want you to make sure that everybody agrees with that, right? So it's just a great way to build that type of visibility and to build, that, um, to build those relationships. Makes sense. Cool. Anyway, slides are online. Uh, you got any questions? Uh, see me around or shoot me a tweet or email. Thank you.